What is going on, guys? This is George giving you my thoughts of Elimination Chamber 2024, the last PLE before WrestleMania. I was one of very few over here in the East Coast that actually woke up at 5 a.m. to watch the show. And honestly, it was definitely worth it. I really enjoyed the show. But without further ado, let's get into it with the pre-show match between the Kabuki Warriors and the team of Indy Hartwell and Candice LeRae. Now, when I made my video a couple days ago about my predictions for the event, I did not talk about this match because it wasn't announced yet until the next day. But I put on the community tab here on my channel that I was going to pick a new champion in... Indy Hartwell and Candice LeRae. Because they might not have been doing a whole lot, but it could have been like that way to really hype up the Australian crowd. I didn't really see a, uh, watch the match, actually, because when I woke up, I was getting everything set up for the main show. And I thought it was going to be on the main show. But no, it was on the pre-show instead. But that was fine. Um, I heard the Kabuki Warriors retain the titles. From what I heard, it was a good match. A good way to start to have a pre-show match to get the Australian crowd ready for the main show and as well for everywhere else in the world that has to wake up really early. And I, I'm not complaining about getting up really early because I get up early every day anyway to go to work. But it is a little annoying because I have to wake up early to watch a show. And I could have went back to bed, but I just didn't. But that was just on me at that point. Starting off with the Women's Elimination Chamber match, we have Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair, Liv Morgan, Tiffany Stratton, Naomi, and Raquel Rodriguez competing for a shot at either uh, Rhea Ripley or Nia Jax for the Women's World Championship at WrestleMania in Philadelphia. I'm going to keep saying in Philadelphia a lot because I'm going to the show, so bear bear in mind that. But yes, this matchup here, I really enjoyed this matchup. I thought this was a really good showing for all the competitors. Um, I know in the beginning there was a little bit of sloppiness with Naomi botching a few moves, and so did Becky a little bit as well, but to be fair, it was also over 100 degrees, so that was one of the big talks heading into the beginning of this women's match itself, he mentioned about the, the weather a couple times. I do like when Becky Lynch made her entrance. She actually had the same attire and kind of like a tribute to Scott Hall, which I thought was really awesome. Um, like I said, all around, besides the beginning of a few botches, the match was really good. And in fact, I, I've seen this a lot online now, too, so I'm not the only one who thinks this way. Um... The real MVP of the match was Tiffany Stratton. I think she did a very good job. Like, I I can't fully describe how amazing she was in the ring. Something I noticed, too, and it's, well, it's on both matches, is when the pods are about to open for the next person, for the most part, there was, like, one major difference where it wasn't in effect like that, but they had... Uh, they had each uh, wrestler in their pod with their WWE 2K24 rating. And for the women's match, and for most of the men's match, not all of it, but most of it, whoever had the lower rating was out next. So that's something I noticed during the show. Um, another thing I noticed, too, is that it seemed like with the countdowns, they had different uh, sponsors. I know one of them was Slim Jim. I forget the other one offhand. But all I know is that they were not the same. So that was something I noticed as well. Um, Raquel Rodriguez also in this match was, was doing very well as well. She made it seem like she was a big threat. As like a really tall, very muscular female wrestler. Um, and of course, Bianca Belair. What else can you say about Belair? Like She's been making it work. No matter what was going on. Like you could have her face brooms. And she could turn into a five star match. Becky Lynch. She's always reliable. She always has. Um, 
she always brings out the best out of everyone, which it kind of sucks when I'm going through these posts on like wrestling community pages I'm in. And there are so many people just like, oh, Becky's so bland. She's boring, this and that. Listen, it makes sense for Becky to make to get all these accomplishments, especially because as of right now, her contract's expiring in 2024. So this could be it for Becky. And if it is, she's going out very well. And she's no doubt about it, a Hall of Famer. One of three women in the main event at WrestleMania. The, uh, one of the first three women, I, I should say. Because I know Bel Air and uh, Sasha Banks did it as well. Um, so much of this match was like a lot of fun to watch. I know I keep rambling on on like different things. It's just all around, like all these women did really well and really good. Um, it could have been because of the TV that I was watching it off. But when Morgan pinned Stratton, uh, she was actually getting booed. Which was weird because I'm like, well, yeah, Stratton is the heel and she's still new. So, of course, it's going to happen. Like, she's going to get pinned. But there were some boos happening for Liv Morgan, which I was surprised on. Becky with the manhandle slam on Morgan to get the pinfall. And Becky Lynch wins the women's elimination chamber match. It will take on the winner of Nia Jax and Rhea Ripley at WrestleMania 40. Now, how I'm going to rank these matches, I'm not going to do anything that others are doing. Uh, I'm, as of right now, I'm going to say, like, would I recommend watch it or would I not recommend watch it? For the Women's Elimination Chamber, I recommend watching it because it's something that I think is a great way to start the show. And these the women's wrestling over the past couple of years has been really good. Like They're getting more and more better. I think after each big match, because we had the Royal Rumble, and they were that was a fun match. Here for the Elimination Chamber, it's been really good as well. So, I think the women's wrestling in general is getting way better. Up will be for the uh, Unified WWE Tag Team Champions Championship. You have the Judgment Days: Finn Balor and Damian Priest taking on. Tyler Bate and Pete Dunn. I still can't remember the name offhand. And whenever I try to look up like match cards, it doesn't say their name. It just says Tyler Bate and Pete Dunn. So at least I'm trying. <laughs> of course, uh, you have Dominic Mysterio coming out with him as well to gain more heat. Now, I give props to Dom for this because um, there were rumors going around saying that uh, the Mysterio heat that he's getting is kind of like just added in for like uh, through editing processes from WWE. Like they're adding crowd noise is what I'm trying to say. There was none of that in this matchup here. Dom pre-match was trying to hype up the Judgment Day and he is being booed to hell and back by this crowd. So much so that during the match... Um, there were apparently fans that were flipping off Mysterio and they didn't want to show that, so they cut the feed. If you were looking to see to make like reads like, oh, this is this is an added crowd noise, that can tell you that it's not. And Dominic Mysterio is one of the best uprising heels, in my opinion. Because no matter what, he has that instant heel heat. Whether it was when he backstabbed his dad, Rey Mysterio, when he joined the Judgment Day, everything with Rhea Ripley, and it just it just shows that this kid has a lot left in the tank, and he's gonna be here for a while, and eventually could go face, and that would be really cool to see. But back to into the match itself, it was a very good match back and forth. Um, there was at points where Bate and Dunn were tagging in a lot. And it seemed like there were too many hot tags in the matchup, especially for the face team. But it, it kind of worked itself out with how the offense was. And there were numerous times in which um, Bate and... Dunn should have won the tag titles. Like, there was a moment where... Uh, 
I guess that was his fin- one of the finishers were hit. Goes for the cover on Balor. And it looked like they had him, but then Dominic, trying to continue with that bad heat, with that like massive heel heat, grabbed uh, Balor's foot and put it under the rope, tried to hide, but then Tyler Bates like, no, like he's right here. And the referee just looked over like, and just sees Dom. And he got kicked out of that. And I love the referees like, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? And like she's trying to hype up the crowd to get them more excited, and eventually she throws them out, and like the crowd just loses it. I, I just love how much heat that Dominic's getting, and so much cheering from when something happens to him. It, it's it's awesome. Eventually during the match, uh, we had. Uh, a bunch of great moments, fantastic moves. Like it's hard to describe all of them in this moment. All I've known is that uh, during the match as well, Pete Dunn did do his uh, vintage finger break on Balor, which apparently he went on Twitter and said, "I'm typing this with one good thumb." So that was like a a mention that yeah, like that he may have hurt his his finger, and it's possible that it could happen. Uh, there's another part of the show which I'm sure people want me to talk about um, that seemed even more scary, but that could have been just a work the whole time. After Priest basically said screw this and wrecked Tyler Bate, it was Bate or Dunn, I forget one of the two. Balor finally goes in, hits the coup de gras. One, two, three. Judgment Day retains. Uh... Honestly, between the elimination, the women's elimination chamber match and the tag title match, any of those can be a match of the night. It is a match I highly recommend go see. And overall, again, the right team won. And now we get ready for what's ahead, and hopefully, our truth gets out of Austria alive. Before we go to the other Elimination Chamber match, yes, we have the Grayson Waller effect. And it starts off with Austin Theory already in the ring, saying that he tried a famous Australian dish and hated it. And he said he got some real good Australian food at Outback Steakhouse. Oh, the troubles. Finally comes out Grayson Waller, and he is given a hero's welcome. It is almost about the same, if not a little less than someone else that got out of Heroes Welcome. He enters through the area, he enters towards the uh, the barricades, and he just, uh, comes across a former fighter and decided that they both were going to take shots from a, from a shoe. Now, I've never seen these happen, um, so this was a little different for me. Like, I, I didn't fully understand it, but. You know, if it's something that they want to do, that's perfectly fine. They're a bunch of Aussie, 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 oi, oi. I hope I did that right. If I did if I did it wrong, I'm sorry. Trying to really hype up the crowd. And then he introduces Seth freaking Rollins with the three-eyed sunglasses, which I thought looked pretty cool. I noticed, too, before the announcement was made that he was doing a lot more things that he wouldn't really do after he had injured himself after during his match against Jinder Mahal. And I thought, had me thinking, like, is he getting better? Hmm. And then, of course, here comes Cody Rhodes, and everyone's singing along to both of their wrestlers' songs. Um, just saying it right now, that was a really cool entrance. Like, it, it went from... So much cheering to, from Seth Rollins to deafening cheers for Cody Rhodes. Like, this man went from mid-card with a tag team of Hardcore Holly to then eventually became a little bit higher up with Legacy. Went down back to mid-card with dashing and undashing. And then became Stardust, which now was starting to get down a little lower. And then when he came back from the Indies, he was already like really high up. Like the like this was Cena cheering from more than just kids, honestly. It's in the ring and he tells Australia what do they want to talk about? And Grayson Waller says, Well, it is my show, so I have the questions already. 
And he goes on about why Cody Rhodes decided to not let The Rock face Roman Reigns for at WrestleMania in Philly. And Cody basically won his story to be finished. Now, two of the big things happen during this segment. Uh, for the, or one, you could tell like Grayson Waller has like some heel moments, but overall, like he is beloved in Australia, so he gets that massive baby face cheer. Theory gets all the boos, and he continues during this event. But the big one, and I've mentioned it earlier when. He was making his entrance. Seth Rollins says he is a couple days away from being medically cleared. So that's great to hear that Seth Rollins is going to be medically cleared for WrestleMania. After going back and forth a bit, Cody Rhodes eventually says that he wants to face The Rock one-on-one. And Seth says, well, you're going to need someone by your back, so I'll be there. As they're trying to get more comfortable being around each other, I guess... Uh, Theory comes up and actually starts talking like how The Rock talks. Finally ends up trying to do the if you smell what Theory is cooking. But instead of really finishing it, uh, Rollins grabs Theory and throws him into one of the Grace of All Effects signs. Now what I thought was funny was as he's getting thrown over, he's still holding the mic so you hear, If you smell... Ooh. I thought that was hilarious. I thought that was funny. Uh, and then we had a Cody Cutter and a curb stomp as Grace Waller's just standing there like, you you deserve this, honestly. And that was basically the segment. Uh, this one, I get it. You wanted to have more of that Australian hype as well as WrestleMania hype as well, but I don't think this was needed. Uh, it, it just seemed very odd when this was just all about something that could have been handled on Raw, honestly. Like, this was very, very meh. And now for our semi-main event is the Men's Elimination Chamber match. We have Drew McIntyre versus Randy Orton versus Bobby Lashley. They're also taking on LA Knight, Kevin Owens, and the U.S. champion Logan Paul. So, this one has a lot of implication because the winner faces Seth Rollins at WrestleMania in Philly. And like like the women's match, this one was really good as well. Now, there was somewhat of a scary moment. And this has been kind of like a talk for a while. Um, I don't know if this is a story or not. Um, it seemed like it at times and at other times it didn't. And that's Randy Orton and his back. Now, we all know Randy Orton took a year and a half. All, basically 18 months, which is about a year and a half. Duh. Um... Took a long time off because of some lower back issues. Um, there was also talks that this could have been a career-ending injury. And periodically, like, I'm watching Randy do some of these moves. And for a while, like, he would just lay there in the corner grabbing his lower back. And it, it was kind of kind of getting a little difficult to watch. Um, if this was a work, then he knows how to work to do a work like that but it, it just periodically I'm just like uh, you might want to stop doing that or this might be it for him honestly uh, the MVP for this matchup I would have to say it's between McIntyre and Orton um, McIntyre because he had a lot of moments where he wanted to just destroy people and you have Randy of course going through the back over and over again still pulling off these crazy moves um one moment that I actually remember this matchup the most is, well, a few things, actually, because I just started to remember them now. Um, when the camera takes a shot at Logan Paul, everyone starts booing the hell out of him. And for a while, I thought, like, maybe it was, like, a lighting error. Like, how some manias, like, they'll start booing from out of nowhere. Maybe because of, like, a lighting issue or it's too bright. But no, it's because of Logan Paul. Also with Logan Paul, he brought a Sharpie with him and started to draw on the plexiglass and had drawn devil horns, a fat person, and wrote down Kevin sucks. So as this is, as the whole match is happening, he's literally playing around 
in the glass, which actually was kind of funny because I noticed it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it says Kevin sucks. And then later on online, I find the devil horns that he had drawn. Uh, and I thought that was pretty funny from Logan. Um, speaking of Logan Paul, he, at one point in the match, before he was gone, um, oh, I actually almost forgot something. Uh, so... Bobby Lashley gets eliminated by McIntyre after a bit of, uh, there was a point in the match where LA Knight was about to go for a pin on McIntyre, but all of a sudden, here comes AJ Styles with a chair and starts beating up LA Knight, which seems like that's going to be a matchup at Mania, which honestly I'll be fine with because I do like both these guys. Um, I don't know. I'm pretty sure they did actually. Uh, they fought in TNA when he was Eli Drake, so... It seemed like it was bound to happen here, but how they set it up was actually pretty interesting considering how LA Knight screwed AJ out of the cha- out of the title numerous times. Um, but that was a very interesting way to get that story really kicked in for WrestleMania. Uh, another part of the matchup too was Logan Paul getting prepared to use the brass knucks. And again, we were talking about Randy and his back. Um, from out of nowhere, RKO, and me at, like, what, what time was it? Like, almost 8 o'clock in the morning, he did the RKO, and I'm like, whoa, he did it from out of nowhere! Pins Logan and Paul to eliminate him. Uh, as this happens, McIntyre, I'm sorry, Orton is setting up for the RKO on McIntyre, as I'm trying to get the cat off the desk. Try to set up for an RKO. Fails. But then eventually, after a while, leads to an RKO. But before he could do anything, here comes Logan Paul with the Nux. Because he was never taken out of the cage. Which then gave McIntyre the opportunity to go for the pinfall. One, two, three. McIntyre wins the chamber and he advances to WrestleMania in Philly. Again, this was a really good match. I highly recommend to see it. Uh, it seemed a little bit like a copy and paste from uh, last year because there were interferences from outside of the uh, participants in the cage. Or, yeah, outside interference. But it was still enjoyable, and it did lead up to more stories for WrestleMania, which was really good. But, yeah, McIntyre takes on Rollins at Mania. And for our main event of the evening, Rhea Ripley, the home continent hero, basically, defends the Women's World Championship against Nia Jax. And if you watched it live, that crowd was awesome. Especially when Rhea Ripley made her appearance. And like, like there was no going back. Everyone was behind Rhea. And for the match, it was actually really, really good. It was, could she handle Nia Jax? Now, eventually, we kind of became kind of stale, I guess you could say, during the match. Especially when we kind of see the same stuff over and over and over again. But when Rhea and Nia had to put in overdrive, basically, they did it. And... The big question was, could Rhea lift up Nia for the Riptide? Eventually she does. One, two, three. Rhea wins the match. And obviously I recommend watching it, mainly for the crowd alone. There was also uh, mentions during the match as well, especially during Rhea's entrance, that uh, her family, 13 members of her family, were there, and she was celebrating with some of them as the show was doing a recap and ending. And that was Elimination Chamber 2024 from 1 to 5. I will give it a 4 out of 5. I give it a rating of a 4 out of 5 stars. Um, If we didn't have the Grace of Waller effect, it probably would still be the same. But this was definitely a really good show to watch, especially with hyping up WrestleMania and having... A big event like the Elimination Chamber in Australia. Pirates or not, they brought the Elimination Chamber. The only thing that I kind of didn't like 
was that most of the matches, well, all the matches, were very predictable. And I feel like that kind of knocks it down a bit because we all knew who were winning all of these matches. And at times it's good to know who's going to win, but it wouldn't have hurt to have a surprise here and there. But that's just me. I still think it's a good show and a great way to prepare all of us for WrestleMania. Um, if you agree or maybe thought of something that I may have missed, find, uh, let me know in the comments down below. Be sure to like and subscribe. This is George. I'll see you guys later.